Sometimes in life, you just got to keep moving. But seriously, are we really moving? Hey guys. hey guys! Now today we are going to talk about dynamic uh, equilibrium. equilibrium. Alright, now in the last lesson there were two major concepts that we had explained to you guys. Now shall we do the two concepts with them again? Yeah, sure. Right, so the first one is on the graph of uh, reversible reactions mm -hmm. and the second it will be on the concept of Kc and Kp. Now shall we jump into the first one? Let's go, let's okay. go. Okay. Now if you look at the first concept where we talk about graphs, uh, do remind yourself, right, there are two major axes that we look at. Now the first axis is for concentration against time, and the second axis is for rate against time. Right, so Mr. Kim, shall we, shall we bring us through the first one, which is on concentration against sure. time? Right, so guys, so we have a reversible reaction here. A mm -hmm. plus B becomes C plus D, okay? So take note, in a con-time graph, of course, as the reaction proceeds, you would have less and less reactants, and as the reaction proceeds, you have more and more products. So for example, let's say we have 10 mole per dm cube of reactants at the beginning, concentration, all right? And at the beginning, my product is of course zero. Now, as the reaction proceeds, let's say the corner of the reactants slowly drops down to six. And of course, Mr. William, the product concentration, does it rise or drop? Products will increase over time. Of course. So it needs to rise. Now, say it rises to four, all mm -hmm. right? So during this time frame, the concentration of the reactants was decreasing, products was increasing. Now, if you look at T1, the concentration of the reactants and products now remains fixed, okay? Now, when the concentration of reactants and products remains constant with time, this is where dynamic equilibrium has now been established, okay? Now, I want you guys to take note, please realize that the concentration of the reactants does not have to equal to the concentration of the product. They don't have to be the same, all right? They just need to be constant with time, all right? Now, Mr. Willem, could you run us through the rate time graph? Yeah, yeah, sure. Alright, so if you compare the first graph against the second, which is the rate time graph, mm. now one of the few things that you must remind yourself is how the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the backward reaction will change. Alright, so let's say we're going to use a similar example. So this is reactant changing to products. We're going to use the same values that you gave us just now. Sure. Let's say 10 and 0. Mm -hmm. Now, as we understood, the amount of reactants is going to drop over time. Right? So let's say we have 9, 8, so on and so forth and this is going to increase over time. So let's say one, two, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Tim, if you look at the amount of reactants against time, they are mm -hmm. dropping. Yep. How does that influence the rate of the reaction? Well, we learn in kinetics that as the concentration of the reactants fall, the rate should definitely fall as well. Mm. Yeah. All right. So what it means is if there are less and less reactants mm -hmm. present, then what happens is the rate of the forward reaction will be constantly dropping mm -hmm. since there are less collisions against time. And in terms of the products, if there are more and more products against time, I think the reverse is going to take place. Definitely. We are going to increase the rate of the backward reaction. Right? So one of the key things that you must be aware is how the respective rate will change against time. So if you look at the axis, you do realize this is the rate for the forward reaction. Mm -hmm. What is happening to this? This is dropping. Right? Mm -hmm. It gets slower and slower against time. But if you look at the backward reaction, now what happens to this is it will get faster and faster against time. So there will come a point where the rate of the forward is exactly the same as the rate of the backward reaction. So you do find it over here at again T1 where the rate is identical. So when this happens, you have reached a state of dynamic equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Now don't be confused right? when you look at these two graphs because they are different. Now when it comes to rates, right, you just remind yourself this, one of them is going down, one of them is going up until they come a point where they will meet. So it must be identical, it must be the same, right? But as Mr. Tim has mentioned, in the earlier graph, are they the same? No. No, they don't no. have to be the same. You just make sure that the concentration stays constant against yes. time, all right? So that's concept number one, which is on the graphs of reversible reactions. Mm -hmm. Right, shall we bring them to concept two, let's which go. is the concept of KC? All right, let's go. let's go. Hey guys, now in the second concept, we're going to revisit the idea of KC, KP, and QC. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Tim, can you remind us what exactly do these variables stand for? Well, they're just reaction quotients, right? Mm -hmm. Equilibrium quotients. Now, and, and simply what they just mean is just the ratio of the products of the reactants, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have this very simple reversible reaction here. A plus, plus B becomes C plus D. Mm -hmm. And we're going to write QC, a reaction quotient, okay. like I just said, mm -hmm. right? It is just the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants here. But you need to be careful because they are raised to the 
power of the stoichiometric ratio, like what we see here, right? And to better illustrate this, I'm going to show you an example, an even simpler reaction. Just A becomes B, okay? Now, what you see on the left here, just time, right? Time going from one minute all the way to seven minutes, and of course, Mr. William, as the reaction proceeds, will you have less and less reactants or more and more reactants? You have less and less reactants because they are used up? Of course. So you can see, we start off with 10 moles of A, mm -hmm. and eventually we hit to 4 moles of B, and vice versa, the concentration of the product B will increase with time. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're going to do here is write the reaction quotient, QC, like I just said, it is just the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants, that will be 0 upon 10 at 1 minute. And if you go on, right, you would see, okay, 1 over 9, 2 over 8, 4 over 6. And as you go on to 5 minutes, look at this. 6 over 4, 6 over 4, 6 over 4. So notice, at this point of time, in five, on 5 minutes, Mr. Willem, mm -hmm. does your QC still change? No, QC has, it looks like it is constant from the 5th minute onwards. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So exactly this, right? So when your QC is fixed, do we still call it QC? We can rebrand it and call it... KC. Yeah, and KC just stands for equilibrium constant, all right? So let me just summarize. Now, for reaction quotient, you can actually calculate it for any time frame that you want. It doesn't have to be at equilibrium. Now, for KC, it must be at equilibrium, which means, again, the concentration of your reactants and products do not change with time, okay? So this is where, from here onwards, we won't, write, we won't call it QC anymore, we call it KC. Beautiful, okay? Um, Mr. William, could you summarize a bit more, please? Okay, guys. Now, the main difference between QC and KC really lies in the definition. Mm -hmm. As Mr. Tim has went through with us, QC is when you have the ratio at any given time interval, right? So, if you take a look at your notes, uh, there's a portion that says over there, right? QC is at any given time interval. So, the equilibrium may or may not have been established yet. Mm -hmm. But once the equilibrium has been established, we will rebrand QC as KC. So what is the definition? Can you see over here? KC is the ratio at equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So that's the main difference between these two. All right. Now this QC, KC, right, sometimes it can be applied to pressure as well, especially yeah. when we're dealing with gaseous reactants and gaseous products. Mm -hmm. Right. So the term C, what does it stand for? Concentration. Right. So yeah. C stands for concentration. If you're dealing with gases, then what is that term that we usually use? Pressure, right? Pressure, yeah. right? So instead of using KC, we could use the term KP to denote for gaseous reactions. Mm -hmm. Right. So we can take a look at your notes. Just a few pages down, you will notice there's this portion on KP. The whole idea is identical, right? Yeah. Just that you're dealing with the partial pressure of gases. So you can see an example over here where this is the reaction and you're just going to write down the ratio of the pressure of the, uh, of the products yeah. divided by the pressure of the reactants. Yeah. But do note some subtle differences. Mm -hmm. For example, we're going to use like round bracket over here instead of a square bracket. So, Mr. Tim, when do we use like a square bracket? Well, we use square brackets for concentration and round brackets could mean anything, right? So in this case, it's just pressure, we just put round brackets instead. Mm. So the idea mm. is the same, but just this time round, we are going to uh, be working with pressure instead. Yep. Right now, yep. this whole thing, KC, KP, kind of oh. sounds overwhelming, right? Yeah. So why don't we do a question to yeah, explain to them exactly how it works? Now, I, I know we're excited to do this question, but before we do that, just something small first. Let's take a look at this equation here, and I'm going to try to write out a KC, okay, before we try this question. Now, if I write out a KC, <coughs> Mr. William, we've got to be careful with this, right? Mm. Now, can solid or liquid concentrations be in my KC? No, they can't, because right. uh, solids are always in huge excess. Right, okay. So basically, let's tell yourself, the concentrations of liquids and solids are basically constant with time, so there's no need to put them in your equilibrium constant, doesn't make sense. So I'm just going to focus on only the aqueous reagent. Again, it is the concentration of the products raised to the power of the Stokio ratio, which is 1 in this case, over the concentration of the reactants, right? And there we have it. Now, Mr. Willem, um, how do I write a KP for this? You can't write KP because oh. we don't have any gases that's present. Oh, There's yeah. no pressure, right? Pressure is caused by gases. Right, right, right. Okay, good, good. Okay, so now we can really do a question. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is PCl5, PCl3, Cl2, right? And we realize that, okay, an equilibrium has been established. We take a look, we peek into this beaker, and we realize that, okay, I, at equilibrium, I have one more PCl5, two moles of PCl3, and three moles of, 0 0.3 moles of Cl2. Now, take note, everything is in gas. Now, if everything is in gas, right, you shouldn't be surprised that the question is asking you 
to write a kp, okay? Now, but we can still write a kc. Just be careful, we can still write a kc. So let's do it here. Mm -hmm. So I have this equilibrium amount in moles, but Mr. William, help me out. Why do I have to change it to concentration to write kc? What's going on? Because uh, concentration is defined as the number of moles divided by the volume. Right. And if you want to write kc, you must be using concentration mm. and not the number of moles. Okay, okay. So th this makes sense. So in this next part, I'm going to write mole per dm cube, mm -hmm. right? So number of moles over volume. And what's my total volume? 3 dm cube, okay? So this part is very simply just n over v, nothing new. And we have all these concentrations here at equilibrium. And we simply plug this into our kc value. And by now, you should be quite comfortable writing this expression, okay? Now, what we're going to have here is also this. I just want to focus on units with you. If you look at the units here, mole per dm cube times mole per dm cube, divide by mole per dm cube. So obviously, the mole per dm cube for this will cancel off with this, and it will leave you with just the units of mole per dm cube. And this is how you simply just write the Kc for this. So of course, 0 0.2 mole per dm cube, 3SF. Easy stuff. Now, Mr. William, let's try to write a Kp, shall we? Okay, yeah. now Kp is a different ball game because when you're dealing with Kc, mm. the key thing is to just change everything into concentration, yeah. right? So that's where the formula uh, N over V actually comes in. But when we're dealing with Kp, the first thing we're going to require is the pressure of individual gases, mm -hmm. right? So if you take a look at the data that's given, we don't really have the pressure, right? But there's a way to actually find the pressure. Okay, we're going to take a look on the next page. Now, the first thing for us to be aware of is in order to find the pressure of individual gases, mm -hmm. there was a law which is called like Dalton's law, which yeah. we learned in gaseous state, mm -hmm. right? Which says this, the pressure of a particular gas is the number of moles divided by the total number of moles mm -hmm. and you multiply by P total. total pressure. Yes, mm -hmm. right. So if you take a look, right, some of the data we do have from the question, for example, do we have the total number of moles, right? We look at the data. Yes, we do, because we have all the number of moles that is present at equilibrium. Just mm -hmm. add them together, that will be the n total. And obviously, we have the fraction as well, right? Just take 1 divided by n total, you'll be able to find that. Yeah. But what is missing over here is we don't quite have p total, isn't it? Yeah, we have, we have a problem. Mm, so how can we find it, team? But, but I do see that a question gave mm -hmm. me um, volume, gave yep. me temperature. Yep, yep. So v, t, and I have n total. This kind of reminds me of PV and RT. Yeah, a very ideal equation to use <laughs> yeah. for this, right? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to use the ideal gas equation, right? Okay. So you can see over there, mm -hmm. PV is equals to nRT. And what is the idea for this is really to find what is the P total. Yeah. The objective is to find this, because the moment you can find this, you will be able to sub into this variable and therefore find the pressure of individual gases, yep. right? So when we do PV and RT, obviously the important thing is the SI units. Yeah, Shall sure. we remind them? Right. Yeah. So usually in pressure, what is the units? Oh, pascals. Yep, yeah. pascals. All right. And what about the volume? Meter cube. Okay, meters cube. And what is the value for R? 8.31. Yeah. If you forget, no worries. It's data inside the data booklet. All right. And what about temperature? Kelvin. Yes, it's in Kelvin. Yeah. All right. So the whole thing is really to do the units transformation. Mm -hmm. And you try to make P total the subject. Yes. So you go work out the math yourself. And you notice this is the pressure that we're going to have. So once we have the pressure, the rest is really just plugging it into the equation, mm -hmm. right? So you can see over here, Kp is defined as the pressure of the individual gases in terms of the products divided by the reactants. Mm -hmm. And remember to use Dalton's law to find the individual pressure, right? So plug it in, press, press your calculator, and then you'll be able to solve for Kp. Right, so long story cut short, the thing about Kp is, it's obviously more troublesome, yeah. right? You have to find the individual pressure of gases, but more often than not, you'll be requiring this formula, Dalton's law, to help you solve for the question. And occasionally, you may need the ideal guess to find what is the value of P total. Mm -hmm. All right, now Mr. Tim, uh, yeah. we do notice from solving the questions, sometimes yeah. Kp can be pretty large, right? And, and it can be pretty small value as well. Mm -hmm. So what exactly does the, the value symbolize? Well, again, if you recall basics, right? Mm -hmm. Kp or Kc is just a ratio of the products to the reactants at equilibrium. So if my Kp or Kc is large, that means I have a lot of products and vice versa, right? Yep. Okay. Okay, so it kind of tells us like the extent of a reaction. Yeah, okay. kinda. And I think we have a graph to show. Oh, this we do, right? we do. Yes, all right, let's take a look. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so we're gonna move down a little bit and we're gonna take a look at this nice little table here, all right? Now, like what Mr. William was saying, your KC, let's say if it's small, less than one, you can see that at equilibrium position, just remind yourself, KC, 
is always the ratio of your products to your reactants. So the KC is less than one, you have mostly reactants, all right, and therefore their POE is most prob probably lying to the left, okay? And yes, now that means, now listen through with me, when equilibrium has been established, right, can you see how we have more reactants than products, okay? So this is what we mean by KC less than one. And you can see same thing, if KC is more than one, everything's the same idea, I won't repeat this. So of course, when equilibrium has been established, the concentration of your products is more than your reactants, easy stuff. And yes, lastly, if your KC is equals to one, then you have the same amount of products and reactants, right? And you can see at equilibrium, the con of your reactants and con of the products meets perfectly, okay? KC just simply equals to one for this scenario. Hey, hey, Mr. Tin, there's, yeah. there's a portion you didn't mention, right? You know, this oh, yeah. is something about delta G. Can you mm. explain to us how delta G works? Hey, sure, sure. So you guys can see, first things first, you will see that when your KC is less than one, mm -hmm. your delta G is more than zero. And when your KC is more than one, your delta G is less than zero. Now, recall what you have learned in energetics, okay? We have learned this. If delta G is more than zero, that means the forward reaction is not spontaneous, right? And vice versa, if delta G is less than zero, that means the forward reaction is spontaneous. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because if your delta G is more than zero, yeah, your forward reaction is not spontaneous, and therefore we have more, we have less products than reactants at equilibrium. That's make perfect. That makes perfect sense. If your delta G is less than zero, right, then my forward reaction is spontaneous, and therefore I have a lot more products than reactants at equilibrium, and this makes sense, right? So simply put, if you find this a bit hard to understand, you can just use this formula here, or just tell yourself that delta G and KC they're always inversely re related, which means if delta G, or rather, if KC is less than one, delta G, you'll be more than zero, and vice versa. Okay, that's it. Yep, that's it for the first series of recap, mm -hmm. right? So we will see you in the next video. Take care, bye-bye.